Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my messy office. Uh, Merry Christmas, etc. Hope you're having a, a good December in any case. This video is a follow-up to my last video about the uh, Dig Media Music Store, and uh, I don't do follow-ups very often. I know I say I will. I still haven't done the follow-up to the Disc Towers video, even though I've been working on the script for a month, but uh, I have pretty big news about this last video that I really needed to share. A week after I released it, I got an email from a fellow named Edward who worked on the design of the music store as an engineer and a firmware developer. And uh, I'm gonna share that email with you, of course, uh, and if you want, you can just leave afterwards. But I also decided to write an essay about the nature of truth in YouTube history videos, and you can stick around afterwards for that if you want to. The email goes like this. Hi, Gravis. I was amazed to see one of the products I worked on featured on your channel. My role was the hardware design for the main music store board and the low-level driver code. I wanted to write and thank you for the respectful treatment you gave a pretty flawed product. You pretty much nailed everything in your in-depth review. Uh, there's a few details I can fill in. Dig in Dig Media was pronounced as in I dig it or dig a hole. Yeah, so uh, I rolled the dice on that one. I came up snake eyes, I guess. I really thought it would be dig. Uh, but I guess maybe Dig was still kind of in lingo at that time. I don't know. Uh, your Patreons are right that the DSP was for running the codec and the Actel was interface logic. Uh, again, I, I felt like it was even odds. It could have been either one of those. And without a deeper EE understanding, I couldn't suss out which was more likely from the data sheets. So I just rolled them. Anyway, the MP3 DSP codec was licensed from Fraunhofer. It could only manage real time, so there's no point trying to go faster than 1x with the CD-ROM drive. Uh, to go faster would have required significantly more expensive silicon. The plan was that users would rip new discs the first time they got played. As you pointed out, that doesn't help much with handling an existing music collection. This is exactly what I figured, uh, that their audience that they had in mind would just be people who didn't want to bulk rip discs, so it wasn't worth the significant extra push it would have taken to get higher speed ripping, even if it was possible. Uh, he also said the uh, super caps and the soulmate should be able to keep the device going long enough to change batteries, but only if it's turned off. A bunch of people suggested this in the comments, and I realized as soon as I read them that I really should have tried that. I'm pretty sure the manual didn't say that you can do this, uh, which is why I didn't think to try, but I wish I'd guessed, because it does make sense. It, it seems pretty obvious now. Turning off the device probably puts the microcontroller in a sort of power-off watchdog state, where it does literally nothing until it detects a button press, at which point it, it could be drawing microamps of current in standby instead of milliamps, and that's just a world of difference. So I just flubbed that one. Uh, next up, he says, the Soulmate looks like an Atari cartridge because the industrial design was contracted to a guy in the US who literally used to design them. It was always a bit of a disappointment how the product actually turned out after all the fancy CAD renders. So yeah, uh, this is something I've heard from industrial designers on more than a few occasions, that a lot of products uh, end up looking substantially worse than intended because what was imagined on the computer screen or the drafting table then had to be interpreted by machinists and materials experts, uh, and then of course modulated by available funding. Uh, it's why I felt okay insulting the Soulmate, because I figured that nobody planned to have a device that looked that cheap. It's just what they got stuck with. Moving on, Edward says, the USP of the product compared to the competition was the lightning fast transfer to the portable device. Flash memory at the time couldn't write anywhere near as fast as we wanted to go. Dig Media came out of a company called Memory Corporation who specialized in novel uses of partially defective DRAM. One of the engineers had an idea as to how we could use our expertise in DRAM to do something different in the new MP3 player market. Uh, I had to look up the term USP I believe this means unique selling proposition. That's a new one for me. Uh, but I have to say, I'm thrilled to hear that I had guessed this part correctly, because it's, it's really one of the details that I was hoping to get right. With how slow flash memory was, I figured it was impossible not to see this as a selling point. And while I didn't quite realize what Memory Corporation did as a company, nor do I fully understand now exactly what their product was, uh, it makes perfect sense that if you're working with DRAM all day, you're going to start thinking of ideas for how you can use that to break into the most popular markets of the time. Uh, moving on, he says, there were intended to be other accessories and enhanced products available. There's a header on the Soulmate PCB to take a daughter board with extra DRAM to make a 96 megabyte version. Uh, the battery pack was designed to be replaced with a rechargeable unit, and the IR remote control sadly never got done. So again, this confirms what I suspected. Uh, I'm guessing the recharging feature is why the battery pack had four contacts on it instead of just two. He didn't expand on that part, but I'm wondering if maybe it would have charged when docked in the music store. That would make a ton of sense. 
Anyway, uh, here's a really juicy part. I've dug out the original development board that I still have in a drawer and attached a picture. And uh, I've uh, put that picture on the screen here, or maybe it's just in front of me. I don't know. Anyway, he goes on. You can see there's a potentiometer for a volume control on the front of the board. At that early stage, we'd hoped to have a more upmarket hi-fi style to the product, but that got dropped due to cost savings. On the right is the JTAG debug dongle with a reset button. Uh, the main host processor was a very early Samsung ARM that had a couple of hardware bugs that we had to work around. So as I figured, they, they didn't want to go with just a digital volume control, but what can you do when the money starts to dry up? Again, it doesn't surprise me that this is not a story of lazy designers or a company cheaping out because they don't care. It's one of well-intentioned, knowledgeable people being stopped in their tracks by the simple limitations of our economy. Anyone who has a brilliant idea should be given the funding and resources to bring it to fruition, but that's, that's not how it happens, is it? Maybe people would have loved the music store if it had been designed to the level of quality that its creators intended, but instead we got what they could afford instead, and maybe a legend died on the vine. I also wanted to mention, I hadn't been positive at the time that the ARM on the CPU meant it was an ARM processor. That kind of assumption just isn't safe, especially since I couldn't come with, with any results for the part number or for SEC on Google. I was informed after the video release that that's short for Samsung Electronics Corporation. Don't know why I couldn't find that. Anyway, wrapping up, uh, he says, For a small company, this whole endeavor cost a huge amount, and we struggled to compete once the big players like Apple started to take notice of the MP3 market. After the music store, there were several more conventional flash memory-based MP3 players. Uh, there were also players with one-inch micro-hard drives, which did quite well uh, until flash memory density caught up. Uh, I assume he's talking about other products from Dig Media there. I didn't ask for clarification, but keep this in mind, because uh, there's a second email later. Uh, finally, he says, uh, thanks again for taking the time to highlight some of the novel ideas that the music store implemented, even if the product as a whole didn't manage to deliver. Still, I was pleased to see that it still worked. So yeah, my ultimate conviction, like I said, is that this thing wasn't what they wanted it to be. And I think that's a really common story uh, from this era. I was kind of humbled by this message, um, to be honest. I wouldn't go so far as to say that I idolize people who worked on old consumer electronics, but I do think that the late 90s, early 2000s period was a time of great innovation and that a lot of would-be heroes went unsung for the reasons that I bring up on this channel regularly. One is a lack of funding. They couldn't convince the right people that they had a billion dollar product on their hands, uh, so they had to get by on a shoestring budget. And you know, that's not just a matter of getting to the right people or selling your product to the right investor. They may not have had a billion dollar product on their hands, not everything needs to be a billion dollar product, but that's the only thing that ever gets funded. The other problem is a lack of adequate technology. People could see where the future was headed. As I've addressed before, they could imagine what the, you know, the 21st century would look like uh, a couple decades in, and they wanted to make those products then, but what we can now do with a $2 chip used to require a whole network of $10 or $50 chips. So. If the Soulmate and the Music Store had been made to the standards of even 2003's market, they would have cost $800 a piece. It just wasn't feasible yet. So I find it fascinating to talk to people who were in the thick of it, because they were trying to realize products that couldn't really exist until the rest of the world moved forward, accepted that there was money in these things, and created higher power, lower cost silicon to make them practical. I think it must have been one of the neatest jobs in the world, even if very often, it didn't play out the way the creators hoped. So anyway, I wrote back, and I don't mean to toot my own horn too much, but I want to tell you what I told Edward about my changing philosophy on the stuff that I cover. When I wrote the script for the Music Store video, frankly, it was meaner at first. And then as I refined and edited it, I softened up a lot. I've been working on this for years, learning how to have the voice that I want in these videos. And you know, it's popular for YouTubers to just pick something up and say, uh, this is crap, uh, this was garbage, this was never good, the people who made it should be ashamed of themselves. But it's becoming increasingly difficult for me to do that in good faith without thinking about the people who made it because they're watching, you know, they're out there and they're people like me and you who had a dream 20 years ago and tried to make it real. Sometimes I think it's clear that very little effort was put into a given product and those products deserve to get dunked on, yeah whole hog, but when you find something that displays any kind of innovation, you got to stop and ask, 
could this have happened without passionate minds behind it? And is this really what they intended? I'm trying to look for and recognize that passion more often than I look for a cheap laugh at something or someone's expense. And I might still fall prey to the tendency, but I'm at least trying. So I told him that and I asked some questions. One, uh, was he comfortable sharing any details about the copy protection? I'm curious if it was serious or if it was just sort of security through obscurity. And two, what happened to the internet audio port? And finally, did he mind if I shared this email? And I'll come back to why I asked him that later. Uh, and I was very happy to get a response in the affirmative to all the above. So here is his second email. We took the encryption pretty seriously. Uh, the Actel on the music store allowed us to implement a real cipher, although memory is hazy as to exactly what we picked. The only weakness uh, was the keys that were contained in an obfuscated form in the main firmware. The host processor didn't have any sort of secure boot, and the image on the flash wasn't scrambled. So, okay, uh, if you don't know anything about cryptography, and I only know a little bit, I believe what he means is that if you had a physical specimen and some time on your hands, you could probably have dumped one of the ROM chips and extracted the encryption key. And then by analyzing the firmware, you could reduce that to a plain text form, uh, and then you could use that with various cipher methods until you hit on one that would decrypt the contents of the hard drive. The reason it would be this easy is because they didn't have the luxury of a secure processor. That's what he means with the, the secure boot bit. The problem that he's describing here is really common. We still deal with it now. How do you make a device? that can decrypt secure data without putting the decryption key on the device, where someone can pull it out and then use it to decrypt things on their terms instead of yours. There's a whole market uh, that's been engaged in an arms race for decades to produce a chip that makes this impractical, but making it impossible is, is impossible. You know, there's, there's a gradient of quality and cost uh, among the devices that do this, but they're all pretty expensive. And at the consumer end of the market, they're still fairly rare even today. So this problem actually continues to be a problem. Edward also says that the little pick on the soulmate couldn't do anything cryptographically, but I think even there we did some basic obfuscation with XORing and shifting the bits around. Uh, now, this speculation actually came up in my comments several times, uh, people saying, I'll bet the encryption isn't really encryption. Apparently this XOR thing is a common form of very light encryption. Technically, I think it fits the definition, but as he says, it's, a, it's referred to as an obfuscation technique because it's so simple that any skilled attacker would reverse it pretty effortlessly, so it just keeps the casual observer uh, from seeing immediately what they're after. Uh, and I'm inferring a bit here, but if the pick couldn't do any crypto, then I think that means that the music store decrypted the MP3s on their way to the soulmate. So maybe you could have sniffed them in the plane off the interface bus, but that was never really the concern here. Uh, as he explains, at the time, we thought the RIAA had the muscle to shut down all these new startups that allowed people to rip music with no restrictions. And our content protection would give us an advantage in the market, even if it was a bit inconvenient for users. Uh, of course, the reality was that once people were used to ripping their own music, there was no going back. So as I suspected, the DRM wasn't really meant to be a feature, but it sort of was. Uh, I was there for this incident in culture. Everyone dealing in digital music at the time thought that the RAA was unstoppable. I mean, they had publicly destroyed the lives of several people uh, with both criminal and civil punishments, and it seemed like they could crush anyone they wanted at any time. So everyone was kind of scared, even people who were doing the more or less legitimate routes. So probably the only reason that the DRM was advertised was to loudly announce that this was not a thinly veiled piracy tool so that dig media wouldn't be target number one for the record companies and any consumers that were worried about it would feel a little more comfortable buying the only product on the market that advertised that it was trying to play ball. But of course, that very quickly became irrelevant as MP3 distribution became normalized and the RAA turned out to be a little more toothless than they initially appeared. All right, next question. As far as I'm aware, the internet audio port itself never made it past the concept phase. Dig Media realized early on that almost more important than the MP3 players was content to play on them. We had another office initially based in uh, Scotland, but later moving to San Diego, headed up by Dave Savage, that was a digital music label. I think the intention was that the internet audio port would link directly to download music from Dig Media's website, a bit like iTunes, but with a dedicated appliance. It's possible the product made more progress that I'm not aware of after the move to California. So yeah, we'd probably have to go talk to someone more on the business side to get the full story with the IAP, but 
I'm not surprised it didn't make it anywhere because you'd really have to get the store set up first. And if I could engage in a little more speculation, that plan probably fell apart the first time someone tried to negotiate digital rights for Madonna or the Beatles or the Rolling Stones and just got flatly told that they would never in a thousand centuries be allowed to do that. Of course, had it been two years later when there were a half dozen companies running huge music stores that did have artists like that, yeah, maybe things would have panned out differently. Anyway, um, wrapping up here, the hardware team I was a part of did prototype a similar type of device called the Flash Mailer, a uh, photo attached, and I've got it uh, on the screen here or, or here. It had an integrated dial-up modem, uh, a module on the back of the board, uh, and a flashcard reader that could be used to email photos from a digital camera without having to use a PC. So yeah, another product from this company targeted at people who didn't want to do everything on their PC. Uh, and this one's actually related to other topics I'd like to cover eventually, because this was the era of mass email. That was the most advanced technology uh, that people were, were getting access to. And suddenly, uh, people were able to do what they do with MMS messaging nowadays. You know, they can send pictures of their vacation while they're still on it, that sort of thing. But without ever-present wireless connectivity, there were a bunch of compromises. Uh, so, for instance, there were actually a couple digital cameras with their own built-in modems. You could just plug them in and email directly from the camera. I'd like to cover those someday, but I do wish the flash mailer had made it to market so it could be part of that video. He also says, uh, the other photo I've attached, which you'll see up here, uh, is a selection of some of the various MP3 players that we did the electronics and firmware for. These are generally for companies in the Far East that would do their own industrial design, and the large players have 10 gig, two inch laptop drives in them. I didn't ask for further details on this, but uh, yeah, this, this is a common practice uh, where a company I think called an ODM uh, produces 95% of the functional design of something. A PCB layout, bill of materials, maybe firmware and you know assembly instructions, and then they sell that design to other companies who make their own plastic case, unique button layout, sometimes customized firmware, that sort of thing. When you dig into a lot of lower end consumer products from the 80s onwards, you find a lot of stuff that's pretty much identical except for the plastic case, and I'm guessing that's what a lot of these things are. Anyway, uh, I was very happy that Edward signed off by saying, I'd be happy if you'd like to share any of this information. It's great to see some of this stuff getting documented. So that's why I'm able to share this with you now. And I'm going to post on my website as well, so it's Googleable for anyone who, who looks this thing up in the future. This was a, a really satisfying outcome. I was thrilled that Edward got in touch. Um, if you're watching, thank you so much for helping me connect with history, as it were. I was also thrilled to find out that I got so much right, and I was already planning on posting a link uh, to these letters under the video uh, once I uploaded them to my website, but then this morning I was out getting coffee and I happened to listen to a video that Tom Scott uploaded yesterday entitled, I was wrong and so was everyone. I was wrong. QI was wrong. Horrible histories was wrong. Hundreds, maybe thousands of pop history books and storytellers were wrong. We think. I'm not sure if there are like Tom Scott truthers who uh, think the guy is a bunch of hot air. It seems like there's always someone who feels that way about everyone, but I consider him more or less a, a paragon of the YouTube ideal. You know, someone who dispenses well-researched insight into topics that are often not considered notable and who does so in a far more engaging way than any TV history program ever did. I really like his stuff, but this particular video resonated with me because he ran into the same problem that I deal with on, on every project I start. In short, I decided to make a job for myself as a historian, despite having no qualifications. And a lot of people do this, and this is a fairly new phenomenon in society, and it has some kinks to work out. Uh, it kind of reminds me of this, this Aquid strip where Ray starts an advice column. I mean, yeah, why would you take advice from Ray Smuckles? Why would he have any idea how to help people? And why would you believe that I have any idea what I'm talking about when I spin a yarn about a product that was made when I was 11 years old and barely conscious of the outside world? Well, uh, that's a big epistemological quagmire, but simply put, you believe me because I sound like I know what I'm talking about. It's like Blues Traveler says, it doesn't matter what I say as long as I sing it with inflection. It's my primary skill, the ability to sound confident even about stuff I'm more or less making up or, or just learned about. My tone makes you trust me, even though you maybe shouldn't, uh, at least no more than anybody else. Uh, the social complexities of YouTube itself aside, history is just a difficult subject, any way you slice it. And the point of Tom Scott's video is that there are elements of the past, even ones that are 
far more important than the design intent of an MP3 player that we don't have answers to and probably never will, because for whatever reason, nobody felt they were notable enough at the time to write down the facts, or they wrote bias into those facts, or they didn't have all the facts, even at the time. As a thought experiment, if you attempted to write a contemporary record of what's going on with the Intel ARC graphics cards for future historians to reference in you know, 30, 40 years, do you think that your perspective and conclusions would be correct? Do you think you have all the answers? Even if you've been to their trade shows and talked to their reps, talked to their engineers, even their executives, I don't think anyone truly knows what the hell is going on over there and what's gone on over the last year or, or five years, except for people who are literally under legal mandate not to share it. So if this product line flops and someone decides to write an essay in, in 10 years about why that happened, why would they be right? Even if they did it now, why would they be any more likely to have the true answers to any of the poignant questions, any of the behind the scenes stuff? A lot of things just aren't knowable. And all we can really do is speculate based on our understanding of the human equation and how the world worked at a particular point in time. You shouldn't take my word for anything unless I'm giving you ironclad data. If I put a picture of a magazine article on the screen with a quote from an employee of a company and a byline under it, then we can agree that that person said that thing. That's why I put those pictures and text on the screen, because I want you to be able to take my research, such as it is, and run with it. If something seems suspicious, I'm trying to give you a starting point to go disprove it. Because you should take everything I say with a grain of salt. I wasn't there for a lot of this stuff, but what does being there mean? Unless we're going to get all our history from people who are working in the heart of these industries, which we all know is a tough proposition, even for professional researchers, we're always going to be going off of secondary or tertiary sources. And those always carry a certain amount of interpolation, and they require a certain amount of interpolation. When you read a magazine article, you have to ask, did this author have all the facts? Are they leaving anything out or interpreting anything creatively due to an agenda or a profit motive or just plain personal bias? And how do I fill in between the lines, cover the parts of the subject that they didn't directly address? And the answer is you do your best. Every fact that you know, that I know, that anyone knows has some confidence level attached to it. You believe some things very firmly, you're certain of them and others you're you know, fairly sure about. And then some you think just might be true. When I feel particularly uncertain about the factualness of something, I try to vocalize it, but I can't hedge every single sentence. I can't put an asterisk in my dialogue every 10 words and say, hold on, this is guesswork. Here's the info I'm extrapolating from. I have, jokingly, suggested to friends that I keep a number at the bottom of every video that constantly reflects uh, how sure I am of what I'm saying. But as I've learned, an awful lot of people listen to my videos <laughs> rather than watch them. So they'd never even see that. That's why I started putting the little pop noises in so people will know to come look at the video itself to see some extra info that I couldn't put in the script or, or that I didn't even know when I wrote it. But of course, even that's not enough. Most people are never going to do their own research. That's a fundamental problem with talking to a large general audience. Inevitably, a lot of people watching this no offense, they're not going to have domain knowledge of the stuff I'm talking about. Uh, they're not going to have a starting point to go fact check it, nor should they have to. What's the point of watching a documentary if you assume that everything you're hearing is wrong? And that really makes this job hard, because I have to assume that everything I say will be taken literally, uh, taken at face value and repeated to others as fact. So how do I keep from being wrong. If Tom Scott, a, a well-funded individual who does this as his sole occupation and has paid staff, or at least contractors, can still make a monumental factual error, then what possible chance do I have of getting it all right when I'm working my research in between a day job and my various personal problems, and I have no staff at all? Well, the proof is in the pudding. I don't get it right. Go back and look at the comments on any video I've ever posted, and you'll find people saying I got things wrong. And they're often right. Some people are being pedantic or they're wrong themselves, but most of them aren't. And I don't think I've ever had a video where I got everything correct. Sometimes it's really obvious stuff. Uh, I said about the IBM 5140 PC convertible that it has a weird keyboard layout. Needless to say, the layout is heavily altered. Um, apart from the weird enter, they also shrunk the arrow keys, uh, deleted right control. They moved print screen down next to shift and put an asterisk on it. 
for some reason. Uh, they lost F11 and 12, uh, and they lost the whole right third of the keyboard. Uh, but it turns out I just plum forgot when the modern PC keyboard entered the market. Its keyboard was fairly normal, and there were no F11 or F12 keys on a typical PC keyboard at that time. In fact, the IBM enhanced keyboard that added those keys to the PC platform was announced on the same day as the PC convertible. So in fact, that laptop may have been one of the first computers anyone ever had that had those extra keys. Several people pointed that out in the comments and I felt like a real doofus because it wasn't hard to fact check. I just didn't think to do it. Then there's subtler things, like um, in the CD Tower video, I explained that you could put all five disks of Riven uh, into one CD-ROM drive and then just switch disks on the fly inside the drive. About 40 people pointed out that I could have just spread the disks across the drives and eliminated even the internal disk changing. They'd all be available right away. I'm never going to live that down. It seems so obvious. How did I miss it? And then there's justifiable nitpicking, like people who say, uh, hey, you're, you're claiming that nobody had whatever device in 2002. Well, I had one. Okay, well, uh, we can argue about that, all right? It's really hard to prove what was and wasn't popular or commonplace, unless you've got survey data. So I can only go off the vibes, you know, either remembered or researched. And more importantly, when I say nobody, I am obviously using the time-honored tradition of hyperbole. Nobody never means nobody. Come on. So some of these errors are debatable and some are unavoidable, but they still hurt. It stings every time I find out that I got something wrong or that people think I'm wrong because you can't really make corrections or clarifications on YouTube. You can try, but you're never going to fix what you broke. Tom Scott's new video will probably not be seen by more than a fraction of the people who saw the original. It'll get millions of views, sure, but they're different viewers. And that sucks. He thought he was sharing a universally agreed upon historical fact. And instead, he's responsible for convincing millions of people, probably irreparably, that 18th century firefighters were sociopaths. It's easy to look at this incident and say, we should shut this whole thing down. YouTube historians were a mistake. We caused far more harm than good, and we are profiting off of misinformation. Obviously, I have strong reasons to want you to not have that takeaway. You can see my social and financial incentives, and I simply can't claim that I'm not biased. I want to keep doing what I'm doing, to keep being the center of attention and getting paid for it. But let me assure you, I worry about this stuff. There are ethical concerns at hand that bother me, and I'm always trying to stay within the lines of justifiable behavior. On the one hand, I have to remind myself that I've taken on a very difficult job. My scripts are very long and comprehensive. They touch on all elements, the design of a thing, which is a subjective and speculative topic, the internal workings, which often require knowledge of electronics concepts that I only sort of understand, the social context, which I was often not really present for, and the intent of the creators, which is unknowable in most cases, except when I get very lucky, uh, like with this email I got the other day. So I've created this enormous task for myself. There are other people who address the same topics, but they stick uh, to much more concrete angles much of the time. They limit themselves to their own opinions and to verifiable facts. I'm attempting to go deeper, and I've set myself apart from many other creators that way, but I've also made a much tougher job for myself with more severe consequences if I screw up. What I'm doing would be difficult even for a whole team of professional researchers, so some slop is inevitable. And of course, one response to that is, well, maybe you shouldn't do it at all, then and that's a fair point. If it's impossible to replace the siding on a house all on your own without getting it crooked, then don't just put it up crooked and shrug it off and say, well, I'm only one guy. Get another employee. Quit and let somebody else do that job, someone who has the necessary staff to do it right. But then there's the counter argument, which goes a little bit like this. Who cares? What difference does it really make? If I get the history of some forgotten gadget a little bit wrong, or I accidentally say that iTunes came out two years later than it really did, what does that really change? What, well, who does that really hurt? It, people are wrong about a lot of stuff. We're all walking around with incorrect data floating around in our heads. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to correct each other all the time in ordinary conversations. Most of that data is trivial, though. Almost nobody is going to walk away from one of my videos with a misconception that will cause any serious damage. And anyone who would use this info for their own purposes would be irresponsible to not recheck the facts themselves. That's why I put the pictures on the screen, to make that easy. And I'm sure there are people who make authoritative sounding material like mine that's based on more infotainment like this. And, you know, that was always a bad idea and they never should have done it. That's not really my fault. 
The sum total damage that all of my wrongness has done, though, amounts to bupkis, and nothing I do here really matters in the grand scheme of things. It's just not that important. And then the final counter-counter argument to that is, isn't being wrong bad on its own? Shouldn't you not say anything unless you're certain you're correct just because? And then there's, hey, within my microsphere of influence, you've made it slightly more inconvenient for me to be an authority because I have to tell people that the thing you said was wrong, which I'm sympathetic to, but it's been going on for decades, and it rarely causes any serious harm beyond little fights on forums. And this isn't even unique to YouTube. This isn't new. There have always been reference books and, God forbid, television shows that got things wrong. I don't know that I'm doing any worse than any of the garbage on the History Channel, and people with niche interests have been dealing with the minor misconceptions that pop science and pop history cause for decades. It's all really complicated. But I think that infotainment, edutainment of this sort is worthwhile, and I think it contributes more to culture than it might detract. Like I said, I, I don't think I'm responsible for a person who watches a TV show, and instead of taking it as a jumping off point to learn more about something, they decide to treat everything in it as ironclad fact and repeat it to others as if they did the research themselves. If you're doing that, stop. There. My guilt's absolved, right? It's not that simple, obviously, but what I will say for myself is that I think I'm a bit more qualified than what's immediately apparent. It's just that I haven't been able to prove this. I have received more emails than the one you saw today. Over the years, several people who've worked on the things that I featured in some of my most speculative videos, the, the ones with the most guesswork, have gotten in touch to say that I got it right, that the tale I spun was pretty much correct, even though I got there without any concrete facts. The problem is they spoke to me in confidence, so I can't even tell you which videos those were. I totally understand their reasoning, but it has always been frustrating that I don't get to follow up some of these videos where people said in the comments, I don't think you got this right, I don't think you got that right, with, hey everyone, per the horse's mouth, I got it right. It's nice that I finally get to share one. Um, it's also nice to have someone kind of speak in my defense, as it were, because uh, I think that this letter proves that I do kind of know what I'm talking about. If I can take a thing from 22 years ago and with nothing other than the device itself and a couple of press releases, I can infer how and why it was designed and what went wrong with the process and how they were marketing it and whatnot, then I think I actually have trained myself to think in these terms, enough that I deserve a little license to speculate and get it wrong. I think my track record has been mostly golden in that regard, other than the occasional minor mistake. But what I'll also tell you is that you don't see my real screw-ups. Sometimes I make catastrophic factual errors that I don't discover until very late in the production process. I've thrown out entire scripts many times, and I've deleted the footage from entire eight-hour shoots when I found out that I'd gotten a fundamental element of the story so wrong that it poisoned the rest. And while I've never released one of those videos without catching the error, I promise you, if I did, and then found out afterwards, I would unpublish that video and redo it from scratch. And that's always hanging over my head, because what I'm doing here is fraught with peril. I can't speak for everyone, but what you see on a lot of YouTube channels, like mine and I think most popular tech YouTubers, is usually someone's best effort. You can't see what pains they went through to get there, the things they got wrong at first and then fact-checked themselves on before they arrived at a final product. So when you hear something that's incorrect, it's easy to think, this guy doesn't care, he's just blabbing whatever sensationalist crap will get him the most views. And yeah, there are a lot of people who will do that, but just because someone makes a mistake doesn't mean they don't care. The point of all this isn't even to ask you to give me a break, I'm already getting one. Almost all the negative comments I get are really polite. The rude people are usually the ones that are very obviously wrong themselves. This isn't me whining. It was just a wake-up call to realize that this isn't just a me problem, and I kind of thought it was. Even someone who seems to really put their back into their work can still get caught making a really serious error. That's just part of the job, I guess, and we should all probably keep that in mind. If you're thinking about making your own videos, you should be thinking about this too. You need to know ahead of time that the professional standard that you ought to live up to will tear you right in half. If you're doing due diligence, you're going to end up spending dozens and dozens of hours making a single 30-minute video, trying to make sure that what you're saying is as correct as available info permits. And very probably, you'll never get a nice email like this letting you know that you got it right. On a lot of subjects, there just isn't any authority to tell you that you nailed it. I think this and the respectful, constructive comments that I get are luxuries, and most people need to be their own watchdogs. You do need to get it as right as possible, because you can't take piss out of a pool or unring a bell. So, to everyone who's given me the benefit of the doubt, thank you.
and everyone else, please remember that I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Merry Christmas. Soba says Merry Christmas too.